I don't think it was done. Yeah, and then just click. We'll give Rob one more minute or so. Let's hope he doesn't run into the same problem I ran into yesterday. I got it. I got it. All right. The flag? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, Isabella, can you lead us in the pledge? Sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America 
and to the republic, the republic for which, which it stands, one, one nation, nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Okay, thank you. Uh, we do not have a revision to the agenda order. Uh, we do not have any student participation. And at this point, we do not have any public communications. Second and final reading, the proposed calendars for the 2021-2022 school year. Um, so let's uh, let's do a motion and a second, and then Tom can give us some information. So moved. Motion by Amanda. Second. Second by Ari. Great. And uh, take it away, Tom. Tom, you're muted. Tom, you're muted. Yeah, I was trying to share the calendar and call it up and it wasn't calling up there, it kept dropping. And then I can't talk while I was doing that. Um, Okay, so the um, the calendar that you have, um, hold on one second. Okay, can everybody see the calendar now in front of you? <clears throat> yes. Okay, so um, this is the calendar that we were talking about for the 2021 to 2022 school year. Um, if you notice, it's kind of your standard where we're starting the Wednesday. Um, before Labor Day, a uh, little unique in that Rosh Hashanah falls immediately after Labor Day. Um, the one thing in here is that it still has Election Day as an in-service day. And we had talked about um, what we were, uh, whether we we're gonna keep doing that. Um, but the issue really is we don't know what elections are gonna look like and we don't know kind of, um, we're talking two years ahead of time and we don't know what digital learning will look like now that now that we've had that experience. So rather than try to move things around. Are there any questions or comments? All right, seeing none, um, I say uh, there's a motion on the table in a second to accept this calendar and approve this calendar for the 2021-2022 school year. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye with your microphones on. Aye. 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 Any opposed, I, say nay. nay. Abstentions? <clears throat> and the ayes have it as a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I tried to put a question out there. and oh. it didn't, But that's okay. I, I'm, I don't have a problem the way we voted. I just, I was going to throw a question out there is, you know, with Tom's um, advice, we could, you know, the advent of being able to change it in the future, and depending on what elections look like, you know, given the information we have today, I thought, you know, the discussion that we had previous about maybe not having um, that the in-service or whatever, you know, that discussion took, we could we could make the changes today um, and then change it anyway. But, you know, I tried to get it in early. I couldn't, I don't, I don't know why it didn't work. It worked yesterday for me, but either way, I'm fine with the way it voted. I was just saying that, you know, we aren't we don't know what elections are going to look like but our best guess is that's going to look like it normally always does i mean that's i i don't think we're going to change an election 
to look differently in the future, but that's neither, you know. This day, they, that if worse comes to worse, you move to the beginning or the end of the year, that's still going to be a day off school unless something changed dramatically, at which point it could become a day in school if we could reclaim that voting space. But I don't see that happening, um, frankly, based on um, our registrars and how they push for things. So, um, yeah, I, no, I, don't, I don't disagree with you, Tom. It's just that the one thing I was thinking about is the one discussion that we've had about this was that sometimes that in-service day, I know you did the parking at UConn, don't know how successful that was. I don't quite remember it being, I still remember the results of that, but we were talking about parking spaces and not turning voters away because it looks so busy that people wouldn't show up because of all the cars in the parking lot. That's, I remember that being discussed. Yeah, that's always the case and always the concern. Yep. All right. Um, and we may have a change on that based on what we decide to do for this fall as well. We'll have we'll be more informed by the time we get to the fall of 2021. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, there's no new business, but we have staff communications and reports. So we'll start with the superintendent's report. Okay, really, I think that um, there's only one thing pretty much that um, anybody really is out there to talk about. Although I will say before I go any further, um, the NAM Foundation, the National Association of Music Merchants, I just got an email actually right before the meeting um, saying that for 2020, West Hartford has been named one of the best communities in America for music education. Um, this is uh, ever, you know, this is an honor that we get um, pretty frequently. We're recognized for our music, but it's it's good to be recognized um from outside um with there's i think less than a thousand schools in the country so when you look at the total numbers of uh, american high schools and communities it's not just high schools it's the entire community that's recognized for it so um a nice feather in the cap of west hartford and i don't really want to step on um the presentations that uh, be back in session this year or not and it does bring up a lot of future planning questions that we've been working on because um there's just a lot of things we don't know right now there's a lot of things that we have to prepare for what does this mean with pandemics and waves what does the next two months look like then what does the next six months look like then what does the next 18 months look like and um there's a lot of needs um we're looking at our technology needs and how how it's working i will say our our google platform has um it's been very good um for our clouds we've had a couple issues of kids sharing um entry but now i think we've got that figured out for our teachers and um jared morin has just done an unbelievable job with our it staff to get it ready um and i can't thank Rosina, Paul, Gretchen, Andy, Rick, um, all of the leadership um, from West Hartford Public Schools. And, uh, you know, we've been meeting with our principals um, a couple times a week with large meetings, trying to troubleshoot problems that come up. And basically, we assigned um, 
you know, we assigned people what they were going to be responsible for and what everybody has done. Um, at times, anytime I get positive feedback, I just want to say to people, it's really them that should be getting the positive feedback. So um, thank you to everybody associated with our schools. And um, just it's a, a good time to be a West Hartford uh, educator, even though it's a very difficult situation. We know that West Hartford now has 51 um, COVID cases, and that's just what's been diagnosed. That's not um, including other symptomatic people that we know are out there. So um, our thoughts with all those people and anybody whose family is suffering, and um, you know, hopefully that the hopefully the tide's turning soon. So with that, that's it for the superintendent's report. Before we turn it over um, to hear more about all of that, Jen um, Evans, can you let us know if everyone Hartford, as well as those that reside in Hartford and attend West Hartford Public Schools through the Open Choice Program, no ID is required. Fully packaged and distributed bagged meals um, are offered three times each week on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 11 until 1230 at five school sites and also at Hammock, the Hillcrest Avenue Neighborhood Outreach Center. Students are provided two-day servings of breakfast and lunch on Mondays and Wednesdays and three-day servings on Fridays, which can be kept and consumed at an, on the alternate dates and they don't require um, you know, families to come out every day. It's important to note that our bag content also follows the USDA guidelines, US Department of Agriculture, and we do adhere to the executive orders for physical distancing, which seems to evolve regularly. Um, we have several families in West Hartford and Hartford on a delivery schedule due to transportation barriers. Uh, that service is fulfilled by myself, a van driver, our school security staff, and we follow a safety protocol for that as well. And uh, people have asked about the upcoming holiday and April recess. We will be in operation on a modified schedule. We will have posters at all of our grab and go sites beginning tomorrow to alert families of this change. And all information about our grab and go food program, including our local food programs and resources are also kept up to date on our district website at whps.org. Um, we are very grateful for our partnership with other food programs such as West Hartford Food Pantry, Food Share, Food Street Ministry, Food Backpack Program. They've served you know, over 20 families, over 100 adults. Um, Avon's Gift of Love Food Backpack Program served over 30 families. Um, growing Great Schools, Hello West Hartford, and our PTOs for their uh, generous support, um, as well as over 200 wonderful community volunteers that we've organized. Um, and so before you cue the music on me, you close my mic, I do want to acknowledge Tim Przinski and our nutrition services staff for their tremendous work and what they're doing. Our grab and go sites are also supported by our school nurses, our school security, West Hartford Police Department, 
They're consistently welcoming. Their presence has also served as an important conduit to our leadership team about questions and needs that our families have. Um, and finally, I want to give a special thanks to WHCTV for being our information platform and keeping us connected and educated. Um, that's my report. I don't have a fancy picture to share, um, but there's a lot of great things happening in the community, um, even in the face of this challenging time. Thank you. Do people have questions for Rosina before we move on? We've heard so many good things about um, the food distribution. Any questions? Okay, so we'll move on to Rick. Rick, you're up. Why don't we come back to Rick? Okay. I'm here. Oh, uh, go okay, ahead. Good. I'm sp uh, when Deb talks, for some reason, I can't hear her. Oh, hello. So I'll have to use sign language, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> good evening, everyone. It's uh, it's good to see everyone again. It feels like it's been a long time. What I'll do is start by taking us back to the start of this uh, pandemic response, and that goes back to the week of March 16th. Uh, you you'll, you'll, will recall that during that first week of no school, we weren't sure um, even in that first weekend, how long it might be before we potentially start our distant learning program, whether it might be a week or two weeks. Um, but pretty much early on, uh, our superintendent made that decision uh, that we would have our teachers back by Thursday the 19th for two days of training, the 19th and the 20th, with a plan to be live by the 23rd. And Paul will certainly get into more details about our distance learning program and how we accomplished that, which is monumental in itself. What we wanted to do early on from a labor relations perspective is to enter into, memoran into a memoran memorandum of understanding with our teachers that would provide us with the ability to convert from the only setting our teachers have ever known to one where they would teach in a, vir a completely virtual setting. In talking with our colleagues from around the state, most every other district was going to do the same thing we were doing and essentially working from the same MOU document. But in many of those cases, it was taking days to reach some kind of agreement. Andy Morrow and I met with uh, Teresa McEwen, the president of the West Hartford Education Association, to work on this agreement. families. This has been nothing short of incredible. And for me personally, it's been inspiring to work next to such uh, dedicated and committed staff. Uh, beyond that, our HR staff is operating business as usual, supporting our district. Um, 
functions like recruiting and hiring will continue. Uh, in fact, we met with a teacher yesterday who will, who will be filling in for a, a teacher who's going out on an um, upcoming maternity leave. And we'll have more of those that'll come up as we move through the next few weeks. Uh, we did hire our first teacher for the 2021 school year last week. Uh, and that person came in under the old way. So sitting in front of a, a group of administrators and teachers, and then sample teaching in front of a group of students. Uh, when we get back from the April break, we're going to potentially going to have to think about a, uh, a new way of interviewing. And we'll talk more about uh, a virtual interview process as we move through the next few weeks. Uh, other activities we are working on include the rollout of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which provides employees with paid sick leave and expanded family medical leave uh, for reasons related to COVID-19. Uh, I mentioned that so far we're only uh, dealing with inquiries, uh, but the reason why I bring it up with the board is that this could have an impact on our staffing as we move forward. So we'll keep you up to date. Uh, on anything that may happen uh, with regards to the FFCRA. Uh, from an employee absence standpoint, so far we have been very fortunate that our staff has remained relatively healthy and we've been averaging about one or two absences a, absences a day during these first three weeks. Uh, certainly working remotely does provide more flexibility for teachers to, to, uh, to work, even if they're feeling under the weather, uh, but hopefully our staff uh, and their families will continue um, to stay healthy through these next few weeks um, as we continue to take on this uh, pandemic. Um, and that's just a quick summary of what is happening from an HR perspective. But again, to, to think that we could have transitioned uh, to this model of teaching and learning and have had as few problems as we've had is really a true testament to the passion and commitment of our leaders our certified staff members and our non-certified staff members. Uh, and that summarizes where we are today. I'd be happy to answer any questions that the board had. Uh, Sean has a question. Go ahead, Sean. Hey, Rick, how are you? <laughs> Thanks for uh, presenting. Um, I, I understand the governor covers our, our wonderful cafeteria workers and our bus drivers. Um, I was wondering about at-will employees that that maybe you could talk about them that are not currently covered under that plan or not under a contract or maybe not have started one yet? So we are, it's a good question. So we are essentially employing everyone right now. So, um, so I, I guess I would include teaching assistants under what you just described, Sean. Um, so they are, uh, we've been keeping them on the payroll through those first four weeks of this, but they are, Gretchen can talk a little bit more about this. We are now folding our TAs into our online learning model. Um, so essentially we are keeping uh, everyone employed uh, as we move through this crisis. I don't know if that answers your uh, question specifically. It, it, it gives me a good understanding. I was also maybe worried about people who may have started their work for us but obviously uh, this happened and are, are no longer working. Um, I, I, again, I'm kind of relying on you to, to know the difference here, but for example, let's say um, uh, a spring coach or a contract is out for some kind of support for a student where uh, it was at will, but obviously uh, the situation does not allow them to meet anymore. I, I can jump in Rick with that with coaching, just in terms of the spring coaches, Coaching's a little bit different in that um, the seasons haven't started yet and we operate under pay for play and that's what funds the coaching. So that's a little bit different. We'll probably get some more um, legal advice and discuss that further with people, especially once we know if there's ever going to be a season or if there's not going to be a season. So that's kind of a um, TBD at this point. And I don't know, Rick, if you have anything else to add. No, every, we've hired about, I'd say over the last four weeks, we probably hired about six or seven individuals. And um, granted, when, when we hired them and they went through this process, we would have never envisioned uh, the model that they were about to, to join us and, and start their work. But we've hired secretaries, um, certainly teachers, um, paraprofessionals. And I can't think of uh, too many situations where everyone is not um, working right now and assisting in, in some form or fashion. Right, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mark. 
Rick or Tom, I'm not sure who this is. And I'm, I'm, I think I already know the answer, but it's just something if. it is that there wouldn't be a spring sport those will immediately be refunded so anybody that wants it they can contact our athletic office and um that they'll be refunded yeah, thanks and what about the plan just let's just say you know for argument's sake um you know they do start a, a reduced season what would the payment plan be in that event as well we haven't gotten that far yet to be honest with you we'd have to see what it was and what the schedule looked like and everything else so um not sure yet. Anyone else? Okay, uh, let's move on to Andy. All right, Andy. Hello, everyone. yeah. Um, as Tom mentioned, one of the things that we've been working on for the people who are not working remotely is, is the remaining staff are mainly our building and grounds and some of our uh, support staff. And our building and grounds have been involved in deep cleanings of our schools and spaces. They've obviously been involved in maintaining and uh, closing our fields and playgrounds to, as we've moved to support distance learning, I'm sorry, the, the distancing. And we've also uh, redeployed our custodial staff uh, in the last week and a half or so to support D both DPW and uh, police and fire. And so they're actually working in uh, cleaning the different fire stations and the police stations and working to keep our first providers, our first responders uh, healthy as well. And so, you know, clearly the, the thanks uh, should go to Bob Palmer and Mike Longo uh, Paul Edlin and all of our custodial and maintenance staff in these efforts that they've been putting forward. From an emergency operations standpoint, um, I've been involved in helping and coordinate the town's uh, collection and support of uh, PPE. We've donated uh, thousands of gloves, aprons, masks, thermometers to both the health department and to the emergency operations center. Uh, in essence, we've gone through and cleared out all medical supplies in all of our uh, school buildings and donated those. And so, again, a, a huge thanks to Grace Johnson and our nurses who have been uh, helpful in coordinating this. Um, some of our schools have been set up in support of uh, our EOC efforts. Sedgwick is being used as a point of distribution for the health department, for um, outside providers. Hall is also being used in, in certain ways by EOC. And we also have contingency plans that we've drawn up if need be to employ some of the shelter aspects at Conard, especially along food production if it's needed by our first, our first responders. As Tom mentioned, we've distributed close to 2,000 devices in support of the online learning platform for students. And uh, a huge, again, thank you to, to Jared and his staff who
in, you know, 2000 devices that need to be cleaned now too. Um, so there's, you know, a plan that has to be, I'm sure you guys are already thinking about this, but just I'm uh, thinking out loud too. Yep. No, and we will have plans for all of that. We've already spoken about, we have records as far as replenishment. We, we replenish those on a routine basis as the years go on. Obviously these are supplies that are used in our schools and in our food production. And so we'll, we'll continue to, to go ahead and, and do that. Are, are they readily available? Say, uh, you know, again, just argument yeah. sake, say we started uh, school in three weeks from now. Are, are they readily available to order? If we needed to in three weeks, I'm sure through the EOC, we'd be able to, to have the resources that we need. With that being said, Mark, I think that is something that the governor will be taking into yeah. account when we go back, because basically every school system now has exhausted their PPEs, so everybody's in the same yeah. boat. And I'll just chime in. I think there's federal funding to help reimburse for some of the costs of all this for schools. And so perhaps this could be framed up as a cost of the pandemic. There is, and we've everything that we've done, uh, whether it's purchases, whether it's donations, any of expenses like this are being tracked by Liz Hewitt um, right. and they are being sent in at a, at a town level for a reimbursement. Great. It, it's a good point, Deb. I mean, it's we've got, uh, you know, 20% to a quarter of our devices out, including iPads, including um, Chromebooks, and, you know, the accelerated usage on that as opposed to what they're being used in school, how many can we count on getting back and everything. Those are all things that we're tracking, and we are going to be doing replacements of those, which we will put in for reimbursement because it is um, during this time frame that that's happening, that we're going to lose X percentage of those. And we're actually, Andy, I don't know if you want to talk about um, how we're beginning to plan for when we need repairs and everything too. Yeah, we're already, we're already planning and we'll be uh, rolling out after break uh, some plans for the idea that, you know, these are, these are devices that have a shelf life. They're going to break. People are going to need to exchange and needs may change in a household. And so we'll have a plan for uh, for that, so that people are not left hanging, uh, and we're able to continue their education. And just as further, like testament to Jared and his staff, basically forever we've talked about how busy they are responding to a thousand teacher needs. Their now help desk is open to all students and families, mm -hmm. so. do what we what we have done what we've accomplished without the effort of everyone else here we're we're reporting separately but we can't work without each other and that holds especially true for people services i owe so much to curriculum and instruction paul and his team rick for mobilizing the people that are that are getting this work done to jared for helping with all of the um the equipment and and for andy with the infrastructure um and for rosina uh, really meeting the essential needs of our families. So, you know, with that, Pupil Services has been able to uh, take on this really difficult task of providing very individualized plans for each one of our students. And so students with, uh, with IEPs are especially vulnerable during this time and have probably some of the more difficult uh, times accessing education online. And so, it requires the people services staff to be especially creative as we're working with families and we're working with students. And so during the first week, we provided um, resources to parents, how to create a structure at home, how to stay safe. Uh, we really worked on our referral process for students who are at risk or really struggling. 
we wanted to communicate our plan to parents in a very clear and reassuring way while building a platform for each one of our special ed students to have an individualized learning plan. And so by the end of that first week, our teachers had created over 1,261 individualized plans based on each student's IEP goals and objectives. And so each one of those plans identifies all the student, all of the uh, staff members on a student's team, how to contact that person, um, how to make sure that they're asking questions, how to get set up with technology, how to manage uh, some language barriers if they exist. But it also then identifies each one of our students' goals and objectives and how our teachers are supporting extended learning through those goals and objectives. Into week two, um, our teachers were, uh, were ready to go and they rolled out these plans to families and they made personal contacts um, and they connected with families. And we've also been working with our out of district providers who were not on the same timeline that we were. So we had about 90, we have about 90 families whose students are receiving an education outside of our district. And we've been working with each one of them to make sure that they have what they need. Um, in many cases, we've provided devices for those students. We've provided um, consultation with our in-district people, especially if their system was not up and running. Um, and we're now about to roll out some one-to-one -one support um, with our staff members to help those out-of-district students um, as well, if needed. We have um, provided some additional training for our staff. Um, and then the, our department supervisors, um, the team that I work with, uh, who cover all of our schools, have worked to create a phase-in plan for bringing our paraeducators on board. So we're doing this slowly. Uh, we brought in about 100 people in the first phase, and we're looking to bring in another 60 or 70 people in the second phase. And that's been very purposeful because not only do we want our, um, our paraeducators and our TAs to have the appropriate training and technology tools at their fingertips, but we also wanna make sure that our teachers um, have the time uh, to schedule and to train and to monitor. And so we're, we're pulling these folks in slowly and we really appreciate their patience with all of this. Um, as we looked into week three, uh, we're refining and developing the individual learning plans. We are, um, uh, we are getting better at it all the time. And as the weeks are going on, I'm hearing incredible stories, very, very positive um, stories from families about um, how they're engaging, how much their students are, are learning and taking from these plans and how much they're appreciating the contact that they have with their teachers and now their paraprofessionals and their TAs. So, um, while there are pockets where uh, things are still um, a little rough and we're still looking to work through them, um, we are working tirelessly and very creatively to meet the individual needs of all the students on our caseload. I've also been working really closely with the special education directors in the area, as well as the State Department of Education to monitor best practices, to utilize additional resources that are out there in the state and to implement IDEA requirements to the best of our ability. And that's all. Great, thank you. Um, are there questions for Gretchen? All right. All right. Uh, and then we'll move on to Paul. Good evening, everyone. Um, glad to be here. Just give me a signal if you can't hear me well. Uh, before I start, I mean, I owe an incredible debt of gratitude to uh, to my whole team, to Carrie Jones, Ashley, Cal, and Mary, you know, all the building CSs and coaches, Ann McKernan, the department supervisors, the principals, um, and, and of course, the whole exec team and Jared and everybody. So uh, this has been a huge lift. And uh, Trust me, I, I get to talk to you about it tonight, but there's so many hands on this work. Um, what I wanna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, describe for you uh, what our plan is. I'm gonna share 
kind of live so that you can see how it how it works um, and talk talk through as I as I go. In week one, we we uh, what we're calling week one, where we brought the learning plans online, and so much of our planning was done in parallel with pupil services, so that we could make sure that as we were uh, bringing up all of uh, all of our classroom teachers, uh, that our special education students weren't, you know, were, were on pace with us. So so a huge kudos uh, back to Gretchen and her team for their work. But our in week one we when we first put this out, we, we kind of wanted to make sure we put our goals up front um, and make sure that everybody kind of understood the plan, not just our teachers and our administrators, but our families. And, and our goals are pretty much here. Uh, first and foremost, we, we recognize that in this health epidemic and pandemic, we need to be flexible and responsive. And, and I know that Connecticut has yet to hit its peak uh, where a lot of the, the real crisis will begin to hit home uh, across, unfortunately, potentially, many of our families to include our own staff. Um, so, so that kind of drove, uh, one of our design principles was that this learning needs to be asynchronous. When, when, when things start to get to be a challenge, we can't predict uh, what the impact is gonna be on families, on their schedules, on, um, on so many of the different variables. So the, the concept of being asynchronous was huge. Um, we had to have, a, a, therefore, a way to hang our learning objectives, our lessons, our instructional artifacts on a student, on a uh, online platform. Um, at the elementary, but uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, our principals have done an exceptional job to provide additional professional learning and to get teachers comfortable with that in addition to being comfortable with what it means to teach uh, in a remote setting. Um, we're using Google Meets as you're doing right now. This is kind of an example of some of the back and forth pre uh, presenting, sharing of screens, and then discussion that happens, um, whether that's in a small group setting at the secondary level or whether that's more in a one-on-one -on -one setting at the elementary level for video conferencing. And we set an expectation that we want at minimum two guaranteed opportunities for every child and then a flexible schedule so that we can have additional opportunities uh, for one-on-one -on -one help with anyone who needs it. Um, so that's kind of the, the basic of what that looks like. Uh, in terms of how we schedule that, I kind of I kind of already alluded to at the elementary level, uh, we've been beginning with one-on-one -on -one check-ins with families, and at the secondary level, uh, here's a picture of we kind of utilize schedules that we already had as we thought about. You know, it's different trying to check in with anywhere from 15 to 25 students uh, versus say 125 at the secondary. So we built sort of what we're calling classroom office hours, which are two guaranteed opportunities where classes can come together and, and meet with their teachers in grades six through 12. Um, how parents can, can get in touch with all of the information, uh, you know, we had to have it online. So it lives here on our website as the first tab. They click on at home learning plans and they'll come to a screen like this. Um, and at the secondary level, as we already said, a lot of that lives in classrooms. So um, there's some information here that I can show you, but essentially when a child uh, logs in, they should be able to see this is my Google Classroom. I don't have biology and art and PE. I have kind of some classroom groups that have been set up, but this is what a student should be able to see at the secondary level to get into different things. And now that's also what um, our elementary students can also see. But most of the elementary uh, information is going to live um, 
here on this at-home learning plan. And one of the things I wanted to show you is that when parents log into it, the first thing they'll notice is the ability to translate the newsletter by clicking on this button um, and selecting any language. And uh, they, would, they would be able to translate the, uh, the entire page uh, into um, whatever target language they were interested in, so to make sure that it was accessible. Uh, that being said, once once they're interested in, uh, you know, they see some general information, they want to dig in more specifically to grade level information. If I'm a grade two student, I would click on this. Uh, and again, we've already pre-populated some links that would translate the entirety of this learning plan into Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, or if they had other languages um, that are a little bit lower incidence in the district, um, there's quick tutorials on how to do it uh, by clicking on these links. Uh, but essentially, uh, the plan at the elementary is broken out. We've told all of our teachers, we want you to post enough content basically a week at a time uh, so that in an asynchronous environment uh, at, at folks' homes and things, they can figure out how much they're going to take on at one time. Maybe, maybe there, you know, there are certain things that we're recommending you follow daily, like at the elementary, like a daily reading lesson uh, a, uh, and a daily math lesson. But then the rest of it uh, is intended here. You know, here's some word study work that you can plug away at throughout the week or some writing. Uh, and if I scroll further down, I see all of my uh, special areas. I see science. Uh, there's typically some uh, coding or keyboarding information, uh, as well as uh, some efforts to attend to social emotional learning and, and different things we can check in with. Um, what we see, uh, this is current week three. Um, so we see that in two days here, we've already had uh, almost 9,000 visitors to this site. Uh, it was interesting in week one, um, when we've had the full week, there were over 24,000 visitors uh, to the site. And that included uh, not just West Hartford, that included uh, hits across multiple countries in the first, uh, in the first week. Uh, we had uh, hits across 16 different countries and interesting statistics as to who's accessing our learning plans from other cities in the United States. San Jose had 713 visitors. Uh, right tonight, New Rochelle, New York, the, one of the hot spots here for, uh, for the coronavirus, uh, has 610 visitors to our week three plan already. And then we see interesting things like Avon, Connecticut, we had 203 visitors, Newington, Bristol, Manchester, a lot of other towns that are uh, kind of looking at what we're doing. Um, at, again, at the high school level uh, and the middle school levels, uh, there is a outward facing page that our families uh, can see that gives a general description of, uh, I gotta change it back to English. That gives a general description of what we're doing, but um, generally speaking, the, the uh, Students are going to access most of their learning through the Google Classroom environment. Um, the only other thing I really wanted to share with you is that as this plan continues, um, as we as we now look on, and we're we're obviously very confident that the state guidance is going to be that we stay out of school well beyond the April 20th timeframe, is that our plans are evolving. Um, we've built in at the elementary level. Uh, some opportunities for community building and we're we're leaning towards uh, how are we going to have more small group engagement um, we've brought on some additional tools such as uh, dreambox and lexia that those are mathematics and literacy tools respectively um, that we were able to uh, extend our licensing with at no cost or very low cost to the district and and be able to provide licenses for home use for any and all students that need them. Um, as you heard Gretchen allude to, we've brought on our interventionists, which on the, which on the general ed side include some instructional paras, uh, teaching assistants, and tutors uh, that are doing um, a variety of different small group work, uh, both remedial and additional support. And I have to really give a shout out to Jeff Wallowitz, who has been instrumental in helping us onboard that. Um, so much more to, to describe, but I, I think I would uh, 
open it up to your questions and see see what it is you'd like to know more about. Uh, great. Who has questions for Paul? Uh, Mark. Hey, Paul, nice work. What do you, you know, I, I Tom had uh, sent an email to us hitting all the hits um, all over the country to our websites and uh, all over the world. What do you attribute that to? I mean, what's someone in Ireland or even California or Arizona, what, what, what would make them want to hit West Hartford learning, you know, online learning? What, what is it? Why, why that? You know, what is it that, um, you know, and, you know, wh why different countries? I, I, I had a hard time wrapping my arms around that. You know, I understand like Avon, Farmington, local schools here in Connecticut would see what we're all up to. But what do you attribute all those other um, uh, hits from? It's an excellent question. We're 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 wondering like how does word get out? Uh, you know, I only have I only have hypotheses or theories. Like perhaps uh, perhaps someone has a relative out there and they're looking. Uh, maybe it's social media. I tell you, the New Rochelle thing, uh, New York was was interesting today, just in terms of maybe the social media aspect, because Carrie was pulling some of those numbers, and two hours later, uh, she and I went into it. And it was up by more than 200 hits from New Rochelle. So I have to imagine that's a person there that referenced it in their feed. And then a whole bunch of other people that just happened to follow them. It's just kind of how, you know, some of that crowdsourcing and, and, and that social influencing works where other people saw it. It's the only explanation I have. I, I really don't know. What I will say on a related note is that um, just as Gretchen was saying that she's in touch with a lot of folks uh from uh you know that are pupil services kind of special education directors uh we're having the same types of conversation with curriculum leadership across the state i'm on the phone with several people and we are trying to share ideas and people are uh, uh being very collaborative and that that's one of the things tom said you know we're happy to have an outward facing uh plan we if if we can help anybody else in the country or anywhere with this, uh, we're happy to have them learn from us, and and we're also happy to learn from them. So, and I I'd add one of the ways. I mean, it is certainly word of mouth's the d predominant way, but this is kind of an example of sometimes when we're amongst something, we don't necessarily realize. Like I can say how West Hartford. hold nationally and how many recognized experts are in West Hartford. Um, it's it's really impressive. So um, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of good hypotheses and just one of those things where I guess if it stunk, it would have stopped after the first week and we've only gotten a few. So the fact that it continues is really a testament to Paul and his team who I, you all know how much I hate saying nice things about Paul, but it is remarkable the work his team did in a short time. Great. Um, Sean, you're up. Uh, I just wanted to give a comment. Uh, thank you to Tom for making the curriculum uh, open source. I know that educators like myself have have shared it with uh, people. Well, I, I personally have shared it with, you know, people in California, local, locally to uh, preschools in Connecticut. Um, and him making it open source and, and just being so vocal about it. Um, is just a great thing. And I think it's such a great resource for not only our town, but anybody else that's taking a look at it. I'm glad, I really appreciate you saying that, Sean. And I think it's important that we recognize, you know, we're citizens of Connecticut, we're citizens of this country, and this is something affecting the whole world. And when we look at the number of places that are still not functionally up and running, um, and we look at the issues of rural America, both in broadband and in just connectiveness or in school systems that don't have the support, whether it's here or in another country, I do think it's important that um, those that can share at times like this. So it's, it's just another reason I've been so, so proud of our work at this time, because it's, it's reaching beyond the borders of West Hartford. All right, um, Ari. All right. Um, 
I don't have a question, but I really just since we're like this, um, Paul was the last one to speak. I just wanted to um, really thank all of you. Um, this was a huge undertaking um, during a really stressful and uncertain times. And you guys made this transition from um, school learning to distance learning seem seamless. Um, I know you had your own hurdles and there was a lot of work behind it, but in terms of as a parent and the perception from parent, other parents that I know, um, it was seamless. Um, and I think the fact that you are um, constantly trying to figure out ways to better support those students that require extra help um, and keeping our students and our families engaged um, and maintain a sense of community. So I just wanna thank all of you. Great, thank you. Uh, Kenya. Hi, so I have a question for Mr. Vicenas. For the, how you guys were able to translate the website first, how was like, how did you guys go about that? And also for the future, how can we improve that? Because I've heard some concerns from parents, um, especially elementary school students, um, parents that it may be harder sometimes when things are directly translated from English, you know, like the word order or the sentence structure. And also maybe for parents watching, who should they contact if they do need like a translator? Should it be the teacher or, yeah. Excellent question. Thank you, Kenya. Um, I tell you, it reminds me of one thing I, I would have wanted to say. Uh, we, we're relying heavily, certainly on available technological tools. So a lot, you know, the, uh, the newsletter that I was showing, which is called a s'more um, and language learners uh, and, are, and uh, are, are certainly likely to be on some of the front end of, of needing some of that help. And our ESOL teachers have been instrumental to, in, in addition to, I don't know if this board knows Amanda Goler, but she's one of the unsung heroes uh, that you need to know about in the district um, as like a liaison. She's been doing incredible work with a lot of our second language families to get them on, you know, onboard them, to let them know about um, our tech distribution uh, process that Andy and Jared have put together to let them know about our grab and go food that Rosina has helped and, and, and things that could be available to them through Gretchen's office and all of that. Um, additionally, with uh, world language at the elementary level specifically, uh, kind of being, you know, it used to meet twice a week and it's uh, it, it's been one of those pieces that doesn't have the same big footprint, say, uh, at the elementary in this setting. Uh, we're looking at using those teachers to support our second language families in Chinese and in Spanish. And we have a few paras in town that are fluent in uh, both Arabic. Well, not both. Some para that are fluent in Arabic and some that are fluent in Portuguese. And these are some of our biggest languages. Uh, so we're using them to help do check-ins with families. And then lastly, uh, when, when a family needs help um, and, it, and if a principal or a department supervisor, you know, they, they have maybe one of the lower density languages in town, uh, we, have tran we still have our translators and they can request that. But one of the things I was gonna say is if, if any good comes from, from this pandemic, 
it's going to be the skyrocketing uh, use and professional development with technology that all of our teachers are facing that, that when this is all over, uh, there's gonna be a lot more fluency with the tools that are out there. And every day I'm being shown from someone a new cool technology tool that does translation or does amazing things with uh, supporting students with a reading disability or, or what have you. And, and I think it's just bringing a lot of those tools to the forefront. Thank you. Amanda? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, I know all of us are trying to be uh, thoughtful about not saying too much so we don't lengthen your day because we, we do feel like you've kept us very well informed in a, in a detailed way throughout all of these last weeks. Um, but as we've gone about around the community, especially early on through the food distribution weeks and the, with the Chromebooks and all of those early stages, um, I just want to tell you how impressive it was to see how smoothly everything went. And, you know, that, that you are where you are right now as a team with your work because you continue to value both short-term and long-term planning throughout many, many many years. So the fact that we're in this place now is a reflection of so much work that's been done along the way. And I can see when you send us our updates that you're continuing to do that, that you've got the short-term track and the long-term track going all the time. And I just want to thank you for that because I know there's a lot that you don't know right now, but the fact that you're continuing to think out um, and to think about all the different scenarios is just so reassuring. And I know that the parent community is incredibly grateful for how you've communicated clearly and calmly. And just really, people know that you care about us as parents, about our kids, um, and that you care a lot about the collaborative working relationship among the faculty. And that's allowing all of this to happen. So I think our concern is also just that you all have time to care for yourselves through this because it must be incredibly taxing uh, personally to have the stamina to do what you're doing right now. So I just wanna thank you um, as a parent also, not just as a board member. Thank you. And I'm sure we all echo those same sentiments. So thank you for expressing them so eloquently, Amanda. Um, other questions for Paul or any of the other um, folks who've presented already? Third, twenty twenty, and do I have uh, a motion? So moved. The second. 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 Uh, so first, uh, a motion by Amanda, seconded by Mark. Are there um, comments, edits to the minutes? We just had one uh, small grammatical thing that we already fixed, so it's tiny. Okay. Um, great. With no further discussion, I'll try your minds. All those in favor of approving the minutes, uh, make sure you're all off of mute at this point. All those in favor of approval of the minutes, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, opposed, nay. Abstentions? Uh, the ayes have it and the minutes are approved. All right, moving to information and reports. Uh, the first item is board members, communications and reports reports from other boards and organizations. Does anyone have reports from other boards and organizations? Uh, Lorna. Oh. Lorna, you're on mute. Can you hear me? Great. Yep. Okay, 
For a moment, I thought I was on a Verizon commercial. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> um, I more so just want to echo the sentiment, sentiments that have already been shared by um, our colleagues. Just want to thank all of you there, all of the administration team for assertively responding to the needs of our young people in our town. Uh, so I guess I'm speaking from the board of being a parent, that is. Um, certainly what we all are experiencing in terms of COVID-19 has no bearing in terms of individuals, age, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, none of that at all. And so the one constant we do have is our education. And I appreciate, Paul, you using the word asynchronous. Uh, certainly so that is the case. However, what is timeless uh, is the quality of education and the fact that you are responding to that and giving our young people some new sense of normalcy in terms of getting up for school and having curriculum and things to turn in. So I appreciate that as a board member and most importantly as a parent as well. So thank you all very much. And I also appreciate you recognizing the need to take care of yourself. I know my colleague Amanda made reference to that and I know my colleagues, we all agree in that same sentiment also. So thank you. Um, Amanda. I just have a report uh, from the bridge because it pertains to what's going on here as far as continuity. school group therapy has also been done uh, via telehealth as well. So for, for our, some of our highest need students who receive mental health support from counselors from the bridge, um, working closely with our, our team in, inside the school system, that work is continuing. The uh, mentoring sessions, because a lot of our, our kids get mentored within the school day, those are continuing as well. Uh, the Teen Center is hosting virtual groups, um, everything from book groups to video game groups to any number of things that the kids can do together. Those things are going on as well as direct check-ins. And they have added uh, some of the kids who go to the Teen Center have been added to the mentoring session. So they've really had an uptick in their one-on-one -on -one support that they're offering to a lot of our high school age students. The Family Resource Center, which operates out of Charter Oak, um, does have all of its programs continuing for the most part. The Parent Leadership Training Institute, they're still meeting weekly uh, telesupport. The parent educators are in touch with families on a regular basis. Um, there's a number of grandparents who are raising grandchildren who get support from the FRC. They're in, in contact with the FRC staff. Um, Peace Place, which is a pre-K program, is getting support as well. So all of those programs are still continuing. So there's a lot of good work going on um, through <clears throat> the Bridge Family Center um, in the ways that they typically work with our kids in the school system at all grade levels. Great. Thank you for that. I'll just chime in, and this isn't um, a report from another board or organization, but more from the community. And I've been informed that a group of community members have gotten together. They were concerned about a lack of activity available for students during April vacation. And they're putting together a whole slew of activities for kids of all ages in our system. And uh, some of the activities that I know of so far are a teddy bear hunt. There's going to be a TikTok dance contest, um, a virtual battle of the bands, a pet photo contest. I think there is going to be a poetry contest, songwriting. So uh, community members are rallying around together to uh, try to create activities for our students in lieu of what we normally have available through leisure services and some of the other um, opportunities that we have throughout town. So I'm sure that we'll hear more about that over the next uh, few days, 
but wanted to just mention it this evening that that's an, yet another way that our West Hartford community is pitching in to help provide an educational experience and an excellent experience overall as much as we can during this time. Do others have comments on this section? students with mental illnesses but also those who saw school as their escape so I think us doing things like spirit days um and again teachers checking in on us so like for spirit days we'll go on google meets and it'll be like sunglasses or bring your pet to school so it's like just seeing that unity and not only chieftain pride but just like West Hartford as a community um it's really eye-opening and I hope it makes some of the students who are going through things at home, you know, more comfortable. Um, Mr. Garta sends us um, emails, like announcements basically every Thursday and that helps, you know, keep us on track, what we're looking forward to in the next week. Um, for example, last week he sent us and told us that teachers would start taking attendance, not for like attendance purposes really, but just to check in, you know, who's, who's, um, on top of things and um, also start grading, you know, for completion. Um, there are disappointments for big events like the musical or the state games, but in situations like these, you know, it's my senior year and I would have never thought like it would be impacted like this. It could always be worse. So I'm just glad that I'm, I'm healthy and I'm still able to get my education. Um, this week, students are sending in pictures to administration with a thank you sign. Um, we're going to make a video for our first responders, as well as like our workers distributing food, um, just to say thank you, you know, for putting their lives at risk to keep us safe. Um, college acceptances are great to hear in times like this. AP exams are still on. So for like example, AP literature, we had three essays and a multiple choice. Now it's just one essay online for an hour and our teachers are continuing to prepare us. They are giving us so many resources. One of my worries was with math. I was like, how am I gonna teach myself math at home? But there's Khan Academy. Um, our teachers are posting PowerPoints with voiceovers. Um, and then of course we have office, office hours as well. And one question I have for Mr. Moore or anyone who could answer this, um, I heard that state schools, so state colleges um, are accepting all AP scores. So if someone could elaborate on that, because the AP is, um, they've changed how they're going about it. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, so actually I was on the conference call with the college board as a trustee when we went through whether there would be an AP test now went forward. And we actually um, polled um, a, a over 10,000 um, current AP students and 91% of students said they still wanted the opportunity to have an exam. So the key was making sure colleges agreed and right away Vanderbilt agreed that they would accept. And um, then there's 22, 22 states that um, accept um, a three or better depending on the on that university within the state. So um, those public universities, basically we had their promise that they'd accept these scores as we went, went forward. So it's basically come down. Anybody that's announced has announced they're accepting the scores. 
We haven't had any school or university say they won't be accepting these. There are some that haven't commented at all, but I think there's so much kind of pressure overall that I, I fully expect um, that the policy towards AP exams won't shift. And then Tom in Connecticut, I forwarded to the principals today, the uh, UConn and the and all of the Connecticut state school systems sent their, sent a letter out, just like what I think is Tom is describing nationwide. So that went out to the principals and to the, our director of school counseling. And I asked the uh, department supervisors to send it to all the AP teachers so kids would know. Great. Thank you so much, Kenya. Isabella. Um, hi, everybody. Um, it's, um, it's great to be here and to be able to have some sort of meeting after a month. But um, really nice to see uh, distance learning program and the the online um, office hours. It's been nice to have some sort of regular meetings to sort of structure our um, our time around and to have something to provide some sort of structure in day to day life because we don't really, we're not going to school anymore. Physically, and so it's nice to be able to do that, and also to be able to check in and like see the familiar faces that of like our teachers and our classes and everything. Um, so um, that's been um, a positive, and um, I want to thank everybody that in the administration has helped to like, pull this program together so quickly and so effectively because um, it's. It's, it's working. <laughs> um, and so thank you to everybody for doing that. And um, our teachers have been incredibly helpful, uh, especially AP teachers who need to adjust their sort of teaching plan um, for the new tech, the new version of our, all of our AP tests that we're using. And our, our school counseling department has been really helpful in helping the students individually. Um, who maybe haven't been training assignments or going up to class in office hours. Um, but yeah, um, it's been a pretty, it's been a pretty um, positive experience so far, regardless of all the environmental coronavirus stresses. Um, in terms of school, it's, it's working. So thank you everybody for all of your help. Uh, Lorna has a question. I, I have a comment. I just wanted to say to Kenya and Isabella, we are all so very proud of you. With this being your last year and history in the making, please know that you are part of the history and you're definitely a demonstration and a definition for resilience, for just keeping it moving along. So we're proud of you, young ladies. Keep doing your thing. We're very proud of you. Here, here. Yeah, but I have one thing um, that I should have added earlier. I just want to thank, it's the most important thing in times like this is communication. And um, we have some very good tools, but uh, I want to thank Ronnie Newton and WeHi.com because anytime I've said I need to get something out, Ronnie, she's gotten that out. And I know the programs that you were talking about before, I had talked to her a little bit. Um, she's one of the organizers and trying to get those ideas out there. So if you have ideas about contests or things like that for kids adults seniors by all means ronnie i know I, from speaking to her earlier she's more than willing to hear people's ideas and i just wanted to thank her for all she's done for us during this time sounds good thank you for that too okay uh future business announcement of future meeting dates um where we are right now and i think these are starting to firm up is that our next meeting is April 21st, two weeks from today. And we are going to use that meeting as our public hearing and budget workshop day. So instead of it being a regular board meeting, 
Uh, we'll have a public hearing and budget workshop, and we need to still work out exactly the technology and how we will do that. We really are seeking um, the public comment on our budget like we always want, um, but we just aren't 100% sure yet how uh, how we're going to make that work. So we will put out some information about that and um, hearkening back to what Tom just said, we will rely on Ronnie and our other uh, media partners like um, West Rutherford Community Interactive, um, maybe the current, to spread the word about how we will receive comment on our budget. Uh, it looks like we'll try to schedule a meeting for the last week of April, the week of April 27th, for our budget adoption. So more to come on that. And then our next regular board meeting is on May 5th, Tuesday, May 5th. And I assume we'll still be virtual by then, uh, but look for more details on that. Are there any requests for future agenda items? The only thing I'd add, Deb, is for anybody that wants to um, make a comment, they can feel free, no matter what system we end up with, to email board members or myself if they have a comment. And um, I appreciate all the people that have reached out with questions. Um, but yeah, any kind of budget comment or otherwise, please feel free to email board members, no matter what, at any time for that. Good point. All right, we do not have any visitors uh, who might provide Is there a second? Anyone? Second. Second. <laughs> Ari uh, seconded the motion. And um, without further discussion, the meeting is adjourned at 8.30 PM. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for um, joining us this way. And hope to see you all very soon. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.